Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you a how to play video for my little scythe. Now this is a, uh, this is actually a really cool story of how this game came about. You can look it up, it basically though involves a, a guy asking Tom Vassell uh, what he thought about getting a My Little Pony version of Scythe uh, printed and then Tom Vassell said that'll never happen and then Jamie Sagmire decided to prove him wrong. So, it, it, look it up, it's actually really funny, a really cool story. So this is My Little Scythe, we're going, it's a family weight game based on the much heavier game Scythe. And uh, we're gonna teach you everything you need to know how to play My Little Scythe. So while you're watching this, if you think to yourself, hey, this is a game I might be interested in, check the description below for a link to purchase the game, and just a little bit of the proceeds from that purchase will go to this channel. Without anything else, let's get right to the table and we'll learn how to play My Little Scythe. First, each player chooses an animal kingdom and places their chosen color in the appropriate location based on the chart found at the bottom of page three of the rule book. You can see we're setting up for a three player game and so the base camps go here, here, and here. Any unused base camps are considered inactive and are returned to the box. Each player then takes a player mat and two seeker minis that match the faction she's chosen. The two seeker minis are functionally identical and also do not come pre-painted. These are painted after the fact. Players will also need the action token that matches their chosen color. Each player then places her four trophies on the indicated space on her player mat. Each player should place her friendship token on the number three space of the friendship track and her pie token on the number three space of the pie track. Shuffle the quest cards and place them on the indicated space. And then do the same with the magic spell cards and then provide each player with one magic spell card. Shuffle the power up tiles and put each stack in the appropriate space. Take this setup tile, place it face down on Castle Everfree, randomly orient it, making sure it lines up with the space, and then flip it back over. For each active base camp, populate the spaces in front of them as indicated by the setup tile. So in this case, the board would look like this. Once the board has been populated, return the setup tile to the box. Players now place both seekers on their base camp. Each player is also randomly given one of these personality cards with any extra personality cards placed back in the box. Also keep in mind both the personality card and the magic spell card may be known to the player that owns them, but they are kept secret from all other players. Finally, randomly select one action pawn to choose the first player. Once the first player is chosen, play will continue from that player clockwise around the table in normal player order. And that's the setup. On a player's turn, she must select and execute an action on her player mat. To select an action, she places her action token on the desired action. On the first turn of the game, she may place the action token on any of her actions. However, in future turns, she must always place it on an action that is not the one she just took. She may, however, use the same section, but it must be a different action. The three action sections are move, seek, and make. During a player's turn, it's also possible for her to earn up to one trophy. Once a player has taken a single action and earned up to one trophy, then her turn is over and play continues. When the player clock. takes the move action, each of her seekers may be moved in one of the two following ways. If a seeker moves without carrying any apples or gems, it may move up to two spaces. If a seeker ever moves onto a space with an opponent's seeker, it must stop immediately. This move will result in a pie fight. We'll discuss pie fights in more detail a little bit later. If a seeker moves while carrying either gems or apples, it can move one space. A seeker may carry any number of gems and apples with it when it moves. Anytime a player moves her seeker, depending on where that seeker goes, it could result in a delivery, a pie fight, a portal jump, or a quest. 
Let's talk about each of these possibilities in more detail. A player may deliver a total of exactly four gems or four apples to this center Castle Everfree space on her turn in order to earn the corresponding trophy. The only reason a player may move on a Castle Everfree is to complete such a delivery, and that player must move her seeker so that it transports exactly four gems or four apples onto Castle Everfree. The player may make this delivery by moving onto Castle Everfree from an adjacent space, or by moving through a portal, or a combination of both. As you can see, it is possible to use two Seekers to complete a delivery, but only if they both arrive at Castle Everfree on the same turn. The delivery happens immediately when the four gems or four apples are with the player's Seeker on Castle Everfree. All delivered resources are removed from the board, and the Seekers involved in the delivery are immediately teleported back to that player's base camp. Whenever this happens, that player is rejuvenated. We'll discuss rejuvenation a bit more later. Excess resources may not be transported onto Castle Everfree, so this means they'll have to be left behind when making a delivery. Once a player earns a trophy for making a particular type of delivery, that same delivery may not be made by that player again during the same game. We'll discuss trophies in more detail shortly. The spaces marked with the pink borders are portals. Every portal is considered adjacent to one another for the purposes of movement. In other words, moving from one portal to another is just considered moving a single space. Notice that Castle Everfree has the pink border around it. This means that it is considered a portal, but remember it may only ever be moved to if a player is completing a delivery. If the player ever moves a seeker onto a space occupied by an opponent's seeker, that seeker's movement immediately ends. And once the player has completed movement of both of her seekers, but before any quests occur on any space, a pie fight ensues between the opposing seekers. To resolve a pie fight, first the attacking player loses one friendship. Both the attacking and defending player will use a pie dial to secretly choose the amount of pie they're going to use in the fight. As you can see, players can choose anywhere from zero all the way to seven pies to throw at each other. In this case, the player's choosing two. However, the chosen number may not exceed the player's total pies currently indicated by her token on the pie track. For each seeker a player has involved in the fight, she may also secretly attach a magic spell card onto the pie dial. The value of each player's magic spell is added to the number of pies she chooses to throw, resulting in the player's total pie fight score. In this case, that score is 4. Both players then simultaneously reveal their pie fight scores. The player with the higher score wins, with ties going to the attacker. So in this case, both players have a score of 4, so the attacker would be the winner. The winner earns a trophy for the pie fight if she hasn't already won one. Seekers losing a pie fight must immediately relocate to their base camp. If any resources were in the space, those resources are left behind. However, the seeker is rejuvenated upon returning to base camp. All pies used during the pie fight are deducted from both players' pie track, whether they won or lost. After all, the pies were still thrown, regardless of who won. Also keep in mind that this number deducted is the number used on the pie fight dial. The magic spell cards have nothing to do with the number of pies deducted. Used magic spell cards are placed in the discard pile. Okay, so we've mentioned rejuvenation a couple of times now, but what exactly is rejuvenation? The player's base camp is where the seekers begin the game, but it also acts as a source of rejuvenation throughout the game under certain circumstances. Seekers only ever return to the base camp in two different situations. Either they complete a delivery or they lose a pie fight. When a seeker returns to the base camp for either of those two reasons, the player is rejuvenated. The player immediately gains either one magic spell card or two pies. And the player removes her action token from the player mat 
allowing her to pick any action on her next turn, even the one she just took. Rejuvenation can occur a maximum of once per turn. After completing a move action and any resulting pie fights, even if the pie fight isn't on the quest space, if either of your seekers are on a space containing a quest token, remove that token and draw one quest card. If both seekers are on a space with a quest token, then the player chooses which quest token is resolved first. Upon drawing a quest card, the player must immediately choose to either resolve the quest by choosing the first or second option, or choose the no thanks option. If the player chooses to resolve the quest by choosing the first or second option, she'll then keep the quest beside her playmat. If she instead chooses the no thanks option, the quest is placed at the bottom of the quest deck. Keep in mind that the no thanks option does not resolve the quest. If a quest results in the player paying gems or apples, she may pay them from any space on which she has a seeker. For instance, if she chose help her study, she needs to pay two apples. So she could pay these two apples or one of these apples and one of these apples. However, if a player does not control enough of the necessary resource, then she can't choose that option. So in this case, help or study would not be possible because the player only has one apple. If a quest results in the player gaining gems or apples, they may be placed on any space where the player has a seeker. So for instance, if the player chose the no thanks option, which says gain one gem for visiting, she could place it on this space or this space. If a quest results in the player paying apples or gems to another player, she picks those tokens up from any space she controls and places them on any space controlled by the other player's seeker, such as this one, Send Aid, place two gems on a space occupied by another player. As before, if the player doesn't have the resources to pay the price, she can't select this option. However, unlike resources, the player may select quest options that would lower her friendship below zero even though friendship may never actually drop below zero. So here you see the player is already at zero friendship. She could still choose better things to do, gain two gems, lose one friendship. Turns out there's really no limit to how bad of a friend you can be. If the quest deck is empty, immediately collect resolved quest cards from players who have completed the two quest trophy then shuffle those cards to create a new deck. It's important to remember, do not collect cards from players that only have one quest card so far. They need to keep track of that so they know when they've completed the two quest trophy. When the player places her action token on the seek action, she will call upon her seeker's innate ability to detect apples, gems, and quests throughout the six regions. To seek, the player rolls the dice indicated next to the action she's selected. Blue dice seek gems, red dice apples, and gold dice quests. The color shown in the icon indicates the region in which the salt resource is placed. The blue swamp, the white tundra, the gray mountains, the green forest, the yellow desert, or the red rock. The player must place all rolled resources. And while dice results determine the region in which the resources are discovered, the player rolling the dice chooses exactly which space within that region. So in this case, the player might put the quest here, one of the apples here, one apple here, and the gem here. Let's discuss a few rules specific to placing apples and gems and some rules specific to placing quests. Once discovered in a region, apples and gems may be placed in any space regardless of what is or isn't already in that space. If the player places an apple or gem in a space with an opponent's seeker, she immediately gains one friendship for each resource placed. When a quest is discovered in a region, the player must place that quest on a space that does not contain any seekers and does not contain any other quests. Remember, no space may ever have more than one quest token at a time. If, in rare cases, all spaces in a region have seekers or quest tokens, 
then ignore the results of this die. Also, portals are not considered to be in any particular region, and therefore no apples, gems, or quest tokens may be placed there as a result of the seek action. In the rare event that there are no apples or gems or quests left in the supply, then those resources may not be placed and those die results are just ignored. When a player places her action token on a action in the make section of the player mat, she will pay something to then gain something in return. For each of these three different actions, the player must pay the full cost and must receive the full benefit. The bake pies action requires the player to pay two apples and then receive two pies. Keep in mind the pie track has a maximum of 10. The conjure spells action requires the player to pay two gems and then receive one magic spell card in return. This card is drawn from the top of the magic spell deck. There is no maximum limit to how many magic spells a player may have. The power up action requires the player to pay one gem and one apple, and then purchase a power-up tile for the move or make action. To do this, the player first takes the top three tiles from either pile. Then, after reading over the three different options, chooses one, returning the other two to the bottom of the pile. The player then takes the chosen tile and places it on top of the corresponding section of the player mat. This tile permanently improves the action for the remainder of the game. There's a maximum of one tile per section and the player may only upgrade each section once. Players prove their worth by earning trophies. A player may only earn each trophy once and places a trophy token on the appropriate space when she earns it. However, any number of players may earn each trophy. Once a trophy is placed on the trophy track, it may never be removed. As previously mentioned, players may earn only one trophy maximum on their turn. However, during the game's grand finale, they can earn multiple trophies, and we'll discuss that a bit more soon. The only trophy that can be won outside of a player's turn is the pie fight trophy by being the winner in a fight that a different player started. Any time a player meets the criteria for a trophy and has not yet earned that trophy, she must immediately place it. The possible trophies players can earn are reach eight on the friendship track, buy two power-ups, have three magic spell cards at one time, complete two quests, deliver four gems to Castle Everfree, deliver four apples to Castle Everfree, win one pie fight, or reach eight on the pie track. It is possible that players may complete the requirements for multiple trophies during their turn. Keep in mind though that certain trophies may only be earned on the turn that they were successfully completed. For instance, the two delivery trophies must be earned on the turn they were completed and the pie fight trophy also can only be earned on the turn it was completed. So let's say a player delivered four gems to Castle Everfree, but also got up to eight on the friendship track in the same turn. The best way to handle this likely would be to take the trophy for the delivery, and then on the following turn, assuming that she's still at eight friendship, she could then earn the trophy for that. The personality cards that players are given at the beginning of the game make it easier to earn certain trophies. In this case, the player could earn the trophy for magic spells on her turn by reaching two magic spells instead of three and have at least one other trophy earned. Once a player earns a trophy based off of these different requirements than normal, she would reveal this card to other players and then place the trophy on the board. Being too unfriendly is frowned upon. If a player's friendship is below three in one of these spaces marked with a trophy and an X through it, that player is now unable to earn trophies at all. Once she manages to get her friendship back to three or higher, then she can start earning trophies again. Still though, only at a rate of one per turn. Once a player earns her fourth trophy, at the end of her turn, the game enters its grand finale. 
Continuing in turn order, each other player who does not have four trophies on the trophy track takes one additional turn. Players taking their final turns during the grand finale no longer are limited to one trophy per turn, but may earn as many trophies as possible during their final turn. Once all final turns are resolved, the player with four trophies is crowned the winner and the new ruler. If, after the grand finale, multiple players have four trophies, then the winner is whichever player has the most friendship. If a tie still exists, whoever is currently holding the most gems and apples on the map is the winner. If somehow after all that, both players are still tied, then both players are the winner. And that is how you play My Little Scythe. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful. If you did like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like my channel, please subscribe. Again, you can check the description below for various ways that you can support the channel if you so desire. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.